Good morning, everyone. Greetings. He is risen. Amen. What a beautiful Lord's Day. I'm reading from Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Note the words, in him. Let's say that this is Jesus Christ. Let's say that this old filthy rag is me, or you, or you, because the Bible says that our very absolute best is like filthy rags, and that's what God sees when he looks at us, unless, unless we become saved. Once we accept Jesus Christ, when God looks at us, all he sees is the blood. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for your blood that washes away our sin. Thank you for being willing to suffer even to death so that we might receive eternal life. It is in your name we pray. Amen. Greet one another.
seated. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, I forgot to grab me a bulletin, but I'm going to try off memory. Thank you. Oh, man. Huh? Ooh. Double informed. Praise the Lord. Uh, men's ministry is April 10th. Is that, that's tomorrow. You ready? Okay. April 10th, tomorrow, uh, 7 p.m. is uh, men's ministry. Men, come on out and join us. Bring some food. We'll have a good time. Uh, then we have a vision meeting on the 13th. That's Thursday at 6 p.m. So if you have some ideals or you want to be uh, involved in the upcoming events and things we have going on in the next few months, please be there as we, uh, we talk about what's coming next. And then uh, they're going to have uh, Jerry Milliken will be here. It says May 6th. Is that Saturday? Okay, he'll be here the 6th and the 7th. He's going to be here the 6th because he's going to be out on the streets preaching during derby time. So I plan on being out there with him. And if, you, uh, if you're interested in doing some street ministry, if you just want to experience street ministry and hand out some tracks, then come along. Amen? We'll make sure you got some tracks in your hand and you can come and share your faith. Hallelujah. So be prepared for that. And if you haven't heard Jerry Milliken preach... You're in for a blessing, amen? You're in for a blessing. Um, and then, uh, um, let's see, board members, we have a board meeting this week. Angel, what day is our board meeting? Tuesday? Tuesday? Okay. Tuesday we have a board meeting. Busy week, amen? That's good. It's good to be busy for the Lord, amen? Timmy Ray told me the other day, he said, if you're not busy for the Lord, he said, the Bible says that the idle hands... Is the devil's workshop. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's see. I think that is all the announcements, upcoming announcements. So glory to God. If we have some ushers, we get ready to take up our Sunday morning tithes and offerings this morning. Well, if you missed sunrise service this morning, you missed a big crowd. It was almost full in here. And uh, so, yeah, it was a good crowd. Amen. Amen. I'd like to see us have a crowd like that on Sunday mornings. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Colin, will you pray over the offering this morning?
bride for a groom Oh church arise He's coming soon Going into an office Check. Okay. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dead and best for a world of lost sinners was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world. As a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Left his glory above To bear it to dark Calvary So I'll cherish the Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown In that old rugged cross Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true It's shame and reproach gladly bear Then he'll call me someday 
to my home far away where is glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the Oregon cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. It's someday for a crown. Hallelujah. Well, thank you all for that. It's good to hear them oldies, but goodies every once in a while. Amen. I knew you would say that memo. <laughs> All right. We just want to invite you to join us in some praise and worship this morning.
isn't there, church. He is risen this morning. To my soldiers watching vain was borrowed for three days. His body there sinless life and took on the sin and punishment that we deserved. There's a God who loves us so much that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And just as the Israelites, all they had to do was look at the bronze snake in the desert. All we have to do is look to the son of God this morning.
I want to key in on the second verse for a second. And it says, on the battlefield, your power is revealed and giants fall defeated. And as Goliath stood there and he mocked the Israelites and their God, David, before he was king, said, who is he to mock the Lord Almighty, the living God? And then on the second part, it says, oh, walls are falling down. As Joshua and them marched around the walls of Jericho seven times, and they gave a shout to the Lord, and those walls came tumbling down. And you know what? And even more important than that, Jesus struck the devil right in the face. The devil thought he won, but three days later, he arose. Amen. Every victory is yours. Every victory is yours. Amen. The name at which every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can be seated for a few moments. Brother Colin, if you would come and lead which you can be saved and redeemed and that is the name of Jesus the King of Kings the Lord of Lords the Savior there is no other many people call on many gods and many people make things gods that they might have something to look to but we look to him for he is coming soon he is the Lord God Almighty there is no other he is the beginning and the end the Alpha and the Omega the one whose blood was shed for you the one who rose from the dead the one who is seated and is seating you in heavenly places with him he loves you. He is coming for you. He says, fear not, little flock, for I'm coming for my bride. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, God. Praise you, Lord. Praise God. Praise, God. Praise the Lord. I've, I've had a great day. You know, if I, if I was to go home right now, I've been churched, especially this morning, that sunrise service and the blessing, you know, and there's one thing we, um, um, oh, goodness, my tablet here is failing me a little bit. Technology is no good. But, um, you know, uh, one thing that, is, that stands out today is that name of Jesus. Our songs, so much it said the name, the name, the name of Jesus. There is no other name given under heaven and earth that we can be saved but the name of Jesus. As Dan so wonderfully illustrated this morning, when you are in him, you are in Christ. It's not you that lives, but he that lives in you, and you are in him. So you don't have to look at your own worthiness. You don't have to look at your own abilities. You just submit to him because he is worthy and he is able. He is strong. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. He is the most powerful one. He, he's stronger than Beskar. 
Only Peyton and I know that little inside joke. But uh, he is the one who reigns. In the Bible, in the scripture, we, um, we uh, say a scripture that we often say at this time for communion. I'm so glad we're having communion today. Uh, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I think it's important at times that we understand the context that something is given in. You know, so often we'll put a scripture and we'll pull it out. But to know the context is so important. And in this scripture, this is where Paul is correcting the abuse of the Lord's Supper. And um, this early church, the first, uh, the first Corinthians, we're going to be studying First Corinthians in our Bible study uh, coming up. Uh, because that was a church... <coughs> They loved Jesus, they were saved, they were born again, but they were rowdy, they were rascals, they had to be corrected on things. They, they got a lot of things um, wrong. You know, they believed in the baptism of the Holy Spirit as I do. And they spoke in tongues, but they, they didn't even let God rule that. They would greet people at the door, speaking in tongues, and, and, you know, everything. And they say, they just think you're crazy, you know, they needed some correction. Well, you know, in the Lord's Supper, there's one thing that kind of grieved me at times, and I've passed it out as these men are doing this morning. And I had someone one time, they refused the Lord's Supper. And they said, I'm not worthy. The Bible says that I shouldn't drink and eat uh, damnation to myself, that it's right there in the Bible. And I thought, oh my, that, that's not what it's all about. The context of this, and I want to share that with you, because maybe you know someone who, is, who, uh, who as a Christian, they, they won't even partake of this wonderful moment of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ because they might, as, might misunderstand uh, some scripture. And Paul spoke in 17, he said, In following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Can you imagine churches doing more harm than good? He said, In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. See, there were people coming together and they weren't, they thought they were eating the Lord's Supper, but actually they were having a show out. They were kind of showing off. Because as it explains in here, he says, uh, he said, for when you're eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. Can you imagine as we're about to have the Lord's Supper that, that um, you know, um, Mark's feed store comes through the door and gives, <laughs> gives Mike and Gloria here some potato salad and barbecue, you know, and then leaves, you know. And, and, and we're all going, well, you know, I couldn't afford that, you know. I mean... This, this is kind of odd as we read it. We need to understand it. He said, some of you, he said, uh, uh, as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. And uh, don't you have homes to eat and drink in? He said, uh, you know, if you're, going to, if you're going to have potato salad and barbecue, do that at home. But why are we gathered together here? Because the ground is level at the cross. The ground is level at the cross. Uh, W.L. Rogers used to say, he said, uh, Jesus is the only big shot here. We're just a bunch of little, little shots. And he said, uh, he said uh, so uh, one person remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do, you, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. And then he says, for I received from the Lord. This is the scripture that we, that we always uh, quote at this time, and it's so, so good and so true. For I received from the Lord that which I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That is the purpose of communion, is to know that my sins were on him. And am I worthy? No, I'm not worthy. Do I mess up? Yes, I mess up. And if I waited till I felt I was worthy to come through those doors, you'd never see me again. Because I am not worthy in my own stead. But because I am in that red envelope, he has made me worthy. He has made it, the name of Jesus. So then whoever eats this bread or drinks a cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, meaning to make a party out of it and make a I'm a better than you situation out of it, then they're going to be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. This morning, as you have this communion, examine yourself 
And if you find, you know, and the Holy Spirit is so gentle and so good to remind you of where you might have messed up. And he loves you. You're in that envelope. And you are there because he has put you there. And he won't let you fall out. Be thankful for that. And say, Lord, thank you that I am under the blood. And Lord, that your body was broken for me. I don't deserve it. I could never earn it. But I receive it by your grace and your mercy in Jesus' name. And he took the cut, or he took the bread and broke it and said, this is my body. He took of the cup, which is the representation of the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And as we said this morning, he said it is finished. His body was broken. His blood was shed. We have eternal life through faith in what he has done. And as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that we are in you. Father, for without you, we can do nothing. Lord, in you we live and we move and we have our being. You are the Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. I knew you had a communion sermon in you this morning. Hallelujah. Um, God bless you, worship team. I'm not going to make you all stand up here any longer. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Children's Church, you're dismissed. Praise the Lord. Uh, we have had church today. Amen. Amen. Yes. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand. Praise the Lord. Dan already done this this morning, but he is risen. He is risen indeed. Very good. Amen. Hallelujah. I love that. I've got a guy that I used to work with years ago, and... and uh, if he's saved, I'm not sure, uh, but he, he went to a Lutheran church for a while, and I know he wasn't saved then because he didn't live it, but uh, he, uh, uh, he, he would always tell me every Easter, he would text me and say, he is risen. Well, he quit doing that, so I started texting him. So every year now, I text him, and, and you know, I, I don't ever see him. He's been retired for a long time, and, and uh, I'll text him and say, he is risen. And he, he'll comment back, he is risen indeed. That's the only things we say to each other all year is, the, is on Easter. And I haven't texted him yet. I've got to remember to do that here after a while. Hallelujah. But as I said this morning, some of you were here, some of you were not. This is the most important day of the year. Amen. It represents the most important day in all of history. Amen. Hallelujah. As I said this morning, everything in our faith, everything that we believe hinges on what took place when Jesus exited the tomb. Amen? Amen. If, he wasn't, if he didn't rise from the grave, then our faith is absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. I addressed that this morning, but not in great detail. Because the fact of the matter is, if Jesus did not raise from the grave, why should we go to church? If, if he didn't come out of the grave, then, then why should we share our faith? Because we have nothing to share. He's just another man, a criminal that died. They executed him as a criminal. He would be just like anybody else. But no, that grave was empty. Amen? It was empty, therefore we have a reason to worship. Therefore, everything he said up until that point for three and a half years of ministry, everything he said was true. Amen? It was true. Hallelujah. And that sealed the deal. They sealed the stone, but he sealed the deal. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to continue this morning in John chapter 20. That's where I preached from earlier today, and we're going to continue that. Don't worry, I'm not preaching the same sermon. Very similar, but not the same thing. Hallelujah. John chapter 20. If you get your Bibles ready, you can stand with me. John chapter 20, hallelujah. Hold your Bibles in there and repeat after me. I believe this is the Word of God. I believe it's the absolute truth. I believe it's inspired of the Holy Ghost. And I believe I can pattern my life after it. 
We're going to read the same thing again today, but we're going to read a little more. In verse 1 it says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she, she came running to, running to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one that, that Jesus loved, the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, which is John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have, take, have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. I almost want to do that as far as Gump. They both were running. Every time I read that, I think of Forrest Gump talking about running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. Isn't that just like Peter? I mean, he's just so ambitious. He just, he's the only one that got out of the boat and walked on water. And he just walks right on in the tomb. Just walks right on in. He came along, went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. And the cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, the one who reached the tomb first, also went inside, and he saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now... In verse 11, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, at this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she told them that He had said these things to her. Now, Father, I pray that you help me to preach again this morning. Lord, help me to keep it real and real simple. And God, I pray that you anoint me to preach, and I pray that you anoint every ear and every heart in this building and online, Lord God, to hear your word and to receive your word. Lord, help us to see in this story, Lord God, how to live our lives, how to live for you, how to love you, and how to hear your voice, God. And Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you in the precious name of your Son, that so graciously give his life in our place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Mary went to the tomb early. You know why she went to the tomb early? Because she loved him. Amen? She loved him. There was a legal reason that they had to wait because of the Passover. She had to wait till after the Passover in order to go and anoint the body of Jesus. It was customary to go and anoint the body to try to keep the smell down and many other gruesome reasons. And so they gathered their spices before the Passover and then Mary and the other women got together as we see in other gospel accounts and they went to the tomb expecting to find a corpse expecting to find the body of Jesus in the tomb. I wonder sometimes when we come to church on Sunday mornings, what do we come expecting? Do we come expecting life? 
Do we come expecting excitement? Do we come expecting to be surprised by Jesus? I wonder. Mary didn't go to be surprised. She didn't go expecting life. She went expecting death, sorrow, sadness over what she experienced a few days ago when Jesus was crucified. But to her surprise, when she come to the tomb, as well as the other women, they were surprised. He wasn't there. It was empty. Mary very likely just took off right then and went to the disciples. She was distraught. She was confused. She was upset. As I said this morning, she was even angry that somebody would take his body because she had it in her mind that that's what had taken place. She couldn't comprehend what she had seen, so she took off back to the disciples. Other account that we read in, in Luke, that the, 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 the women there, they went, they come to the tomb, they, they looked in, they went in, there was these two angels, and the angels said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he's alive, he is risen. So they go, and they tell the disciples, now, you might have been here this morning. Just hang on. I'm going to get to a part that I didn't already say. So they go back to the disciples. And you've got the women that was at the tomb that seen the angels, and you've got Mary. And they're both given two different messages here. It's like if me and Brother Mike got up here with two microphones, and he's preaching out of John, and I'm preaching out of 2 Corinthians. And we're both trying to preach at the same time. It might be a good message. It might be what, what, we, what we've experienced because technically it's what Mary experienced. She's seen an empty tomb and in her fleshly mind she thought somebody stole the body. And you get all these messages coming to the disciples and they're like, whoa, wait a minute. They, they, were, they were an emotional wreck, the women were. And, as a, and, in, and in Luke 24 it tells that the disciples, they couldn't make sense of what they were saying. It sounded like nonsense to them, so they get up and they run to the tomb. I'm going to go see what took place. I'm going to go see what took place. And they themselves, when they come to the tomb, they see the empty tomb. They see the linen line there. Like Jesus just, as I said this morning, the, the, the grave cloth was in the shape of his body, and they just deflated. Jesus was gone. And they're looking at this and, and, and trying to comprehend what they see, and it doesn't make sense to them. So they leave there a little bit confused. It says that John believed. We see that there. John says, he says, he believed when he saw the empty tomb. He believed, but he still didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the grave according to the Scriptures. He knew he was alive. He knew something was different, but he didn't understand. He didn't comprehend it. Amen? There's many people that don't comprehend the message of the gospel, the, 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 the message of the resurrection of Jesus and understand the importance of it. Believe it or not, there are many Christians that sit in the pew that believe that Jesus is Lord, but they do not understand the resurrection. Matter of a fact, many will avoid a conversation about it because it doesn't make sense to them that somebody would come back to life after death. This morning, early this morning, I shared about four stages of belief that the disciples went through in the, in, in, in after finding the empty tomb. Well, this morning, I want to focus, rather than the, the viewpoint of the disciples, I want to look at Mary. Because Mary was another character in this, and we see some great detail there. And I want us to look from her perspective. Because I think many of us can relate to Mary. Amen? Mary had a deep devotion to the Lord, as many in here do. A deep devotion. Love the Lord. Would follow Him anywhere. But she wasn't like that because He had massive crowds, because He was popular. Everybody knew who Jesus was. He come into town, man, the crowds just gathered. And, and, and it would be a packed house. He'd go to somebody's house and there would be people all outside listening to what He said. But it wasn't because of that. that. She didn't follow him because that's what everybody else was doing. 
She didn't follow him because, like some of the disciples thought, that, that he was going to be this, this, this conquering king. That, that he, they believed he was the Messiah, but they thought that he was going to deliver them from Rome. She didn't even think that. She didn't follow him for that reason. Judas followed him for that reason. But, but Mary didn't. Mary didn't follow him for that reason. Mary didn't follow him because he had the, these, these powers, these, these supernatural powers through the Holy Spirit that he could, he could heal the sick, the blind could see, the deaf could, could hear, the mute could speak. She didn't follow him for that reason. Just, just like I think many of us in here don't follow Jesus because of those things. We follow Jesus because of what he's done for us. Amen? We follow him because of what he's done for us. The fact that he set us free from sin. You see, the thing about Mary is Mary had baggage. Mary had baggage. She came from a, a deep, dark past, and she needed help at one time in her life. She had troubles, a lot of troubles, to be honest. The Bible doesn't tell us all of what Mary dealt with in her life, but, but we do find some, some details. In Luke chapter 8, Verse 2 and 3, or in verse 2, it says, Mary Magdalene, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. From whom seven demons had come out. That verifies what Mark says in chapter 16. The same thing about Mary. Several times in the Gospels, we're told about demonic possession. We see it described, and it's, it's violent. Amen? It's violent and it's abusive. So if you can imagine in your mind what Mary was going through. There's the one story in the Bible about the man possessed by demons. Uh, he was called Legion because there were so many demons. And he was, he was out of the town. You know, he was chained up and, 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 and casted away. Nobody wanted to be around him. They were scared to death of him. So you can imagine Mary if she was dealing with seven demons in her life. Now, you know, you hear on TV and in the radio and in this culture, people say, well, I've got my demons. That makes me so angry. They don't even have a clue what they're talking about. They've never seen somebody with demonic possession. It's violent. It's abusive. It's not pretty at all. But Mary had seven demons, and Jesus delivered her from those seven demons. She was rejected by family. She was rejected by society. Nobody wanted to be around this woman. Nobody liked this woman. People avoided her. They were scared of her. But Jesus wasn't. Jesus had compassion on her. And she was delivered from seven demons, from this demonic possession. Mary was devoted to Jesus out of gratitude. She loved him because of what he'd done for her, amen? We love him because of what he's done for us, the fact that he saved us from sin, amen? He saved us from the bondage, the baggage that we've had in our lives. And some may be like, well, I've still got baggage. Well, don't we all? Don't we all? So you can see why Mary was, was so distraught that she went to the tomb early. That she got to the tomb way early, before dark, or before daylight. She wanted to be there first. Jesus was the one person who cared about her. Jesus was the one person that, that noticed her. The one person who showed compassion on her. And he was gone. And he was gone. Some of you in here have lost loved ones in a similar way. Someone that was so near and dear. Someone that you could talk to. Someone that you could trust. Someone that cared. Someone that listened. Someone that was there for you. And then all of a sudden, they're gone. So you should be able to relate to how Mary felt. Not knowing how to handle yourself. Not knowing how to comprehend what you see. I mean, we can look at these stories of the resurrection and we can say, well, they should have known. He's done told them about it. But no, when emotion gets the best of you, you just don't think. You just don't think. She was broken. She was broken, and in her mind, the only thing she could think of was somebody took his body. 
I didn't even get to anoint him. Can you, see, can you sense the remorse in Mary? Mary went through that state of confusion. What happened to Jesus? But she, as I said, she made up in her mind that somebody has stolen the body. Many who hear the gospel message for the first time reason in their minds as to what makes the most sense. I can't tell you how many times I've shared my faith with somebody, talking about Jesus and, and the miracles and the gospel and all of these things, and they come up with some kind of worldly viewpoint of how that happened. You know, he didn't walk on water. He was in a flooded part of the lake where there were stumps under the water. I've heard all kinds of stuff. And you, you, we try to reason in our minds. I remember before I was saved, I would try to reason in my mind what made the most sense from a worldly standpoint. That's natural for us, amen? We do that in the flesh. We try to reason. We're, we're, we're a tad bit skeptical, many of us, amen? So the women went and explained this to the disciples, what they had seen, what they had heard from the angels. And obviously, as I said, they, they, were, they were confusing the disciples because they was given mixed messages, amen? And the disciples, rather than trying to decipher all this, they took off to the tomb. It makes me think of something that happened to us back several years ago. We were in Oklahoma, and we was on vacation, and, and we were staying right in Oklahoma City, and uh, Abigail was pretty little. I don't remember how old she was. Do you? She was like in third grade. She was, she was pretty little. And uh, so we're asleep in a motel room, and it's one of them motel rooms where you've got a, the, like a, a master's section of the motel room, you know, a, a bigger bed and everything, and then there's a wall separates the rest of the room. Well, the kids slept in that part of the room, a fold-out bed and whatever. And uh, so I'm asleep, angels, everybody's asleep, and all of a sudden, somebody knocks on the door. And instantly, I wake up in the bed, and I said, Abigail! I don't know why I was thinking this, but I thought, she's gone. It's pitch black in the room. I've been asleep the whole time. I get up and come to the door in the dark. I open the door, and a security guard is standing there with my daughter. And I'm like, this has got to be a dream. You know, I'm, I'm pinching myself, and I'm like, what in the world is going on here? And he said, I found her down by the pool. Now, this is one of them motels where you walk around outside. You don't have hallways inside the, the building. It's all open outside, you know. And so she had walked outside in the middle of Oklahoma City and was walking down by the pool, and a stranger found her and took her to the security guard. And I'm being bombarded with all of this. And in the middle of all this, Abigail says, but I woke up in the room next door. And I, I knew I wasn't in our room, so I, I, I let myself out. I said, what do you mean you woke up in the room next door? And she said, well, I don't know. She said, I woke up. And she said, you and mom wasn't there. It was some man and his wife and their kids. And, and I'm like, why am I in here? And, and I let myself out. And I couldn't remember how to get in your all's room. And I thought, oh, no, this just went from bad to really bad. <laughs> because now I'm not just confused. The wrath of dad is about to come out because I'm thinking, why were you in that room? So rather than try to decipher all this, I go to that room and I beat on the door. And this guy comes out and I confront him. And by then the security guards got the police there. And I'm, I'm ready to rip his head off because I don't know what's happened here. Why did you have my daughter in your room, you know? And... So this guy's like, uh, 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 he's, he's panicking. He's like, I'm either getting locked up or killed, one or the other. I don't know what's coming my way. And so come to find out, as we continually talked to Abigail and tried to figure the situation out, that poor guy next door, because what she did is she had a dream that she was in somebody else's room and let herself out and begin to walk around outside. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you what, that was one of the um, most emotional days of my life. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord, it was just a dream. <laughs> but anyway, and I can kind of relate to the disciples. When the women are there and they're trying to explain this, even when the women come to the tomb and they see this, and when Mary comes to the tomb and she sees it empty, what in the world is taking place here? Confusion. Amen? 
After Peter and John had left the tomb that morning, they ran to the tomb. Remember, John beat him there. And they ran to the tomb. And, and, and after they had left to go back where they were, Mary comes back. Mary comes back. She didn't run to the tomb with Peter and John, but they was there long enough that when, 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 she le when they left, she returned. And she was crying. And she looked into the tomb. And she saw the same things that the disciples seen, except there was two angels there again. One at the head, one at the foot. Kind of represents the cherubim on either side of the mercy seat. Amen? And so she looked in. She's seen the same thing. She's seen the evidence. She's seen the stone rolled away. Look, at, look in verse, verse 11. Verse 11, it says, Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying, and she, as she wept, she bent over and looked into the tomb and saw the two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they put him. Mary witnessed the evidence. As I said before, there's four stages of belief. There's that stage when you're like, I don't know. I, I, it don't make sense. Standing there with a security guard with your daughter telling you this story. That, that this doesn't make sense to me. I got to discover some evidence. So I knock on the door next door. Hey, dude, why was my daughter in your room? What are you talking about? I don't know. I never met your daughter. She wasn't in our room. Yeah, that's a good story. She says she was in your room. So you go and you discover the evidence. Mary done the same thing. She seen the stone rolled away. She looked into the tomb rather than running off this time. She looked into the tomb. She seen the grave cloth lying there. Empty, fold, uh, in the shape of Jesus' body, the face cloth to the side, folded up. And, 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 and she sees that, and she still thinks that grave robbers took Jesus. If a grave robber took Jesus, would you, if you was going to rob a grave, let me just say this and be real. If you was going to rob a grave, and the body has been laying there for, for a few days, and it's wrapped in linen cloths tightly, would you unwrap the body? I don't know if you've ever been around a body that's been lying there dead for a few days, but it is not pretty. It stinketh badly. So why would you do that? You see what I'm saying? Mary couldn't register in her mind what has taken place here. She still thought that the body had been stolen. Even though she had the evidence of the angels, of the message the women had heard earlier. She had the evidence of everything that Jesus had said. The, 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 the times that he said that, that, he, would, that he would die and, and, and be buried and be raised from the grave in, in Matthew chapter 17. Verse 22, it says, When they came together in Galilee, this is Jesus going to tell this here, He said to them, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill Him, and on the third day He will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. It says, He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For Jonah was, was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights into the heart of the earth. There's two times Jesus, Jesus prophesied about his death, burial, and resurrection. In John chapter 2, Jesus said this. He said, destroy this temple, and I will, I will raise it again in three days, speaking to the religious leaders. And they replied to him, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. Are you going to raise it again in three days? That's absurd, Jesus. Why would you say such a thing? But Jesus wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about himself. Amen? He was prophesying of what was going to take place, that he was going to be executed, buried, and then raised from the grave. Old Testament, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in His presence. Isaiah 25, verse 8, He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. 
Psalm 16. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor let your faithful one see decay. Even the Old Testament proclaimed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Back over here in John 20. We read there where, where Mary comes to the tomb. She sees the evidence of the, 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 the grave cloth. She sees the two angels there. They say, why are you crying? She says, they've taken my Lord away. They've taken my Lord away. But then, but then, suddenly, Jesus appeared. But then suddenly Jesus appeared. Look what it says there. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize that it was Jesus. She didn't realize that it was Jesus. He even spoke to her. He said, woman, why are you crying? How many of you women would take offense to that if somebody looked at you and said, woman, why are you crying? <clears throat> Probably a few of you. That's what I do when I want to aggravate my wife. Woman, do this, do that. Yeah, bake me a pie, Charlie Wright. But this is the thing. She's still blinded by her grief. Amen? She's having an encounter with the risen Savior and doesn't even realize it. You know how many times in my life before I got saved I had an encounter with the risen Savior and didn't realize it? He's knocking at my heart's door. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. Amen? He's knocking right now. He's standing there with Mary. I, I can picture Jesus smiling. Like, you don't even know. You, you ain't even got a clue. And, it, you know, I can just picture him having a moment there. But she saw him as a man. She thought he was the gardener. She saw him as a man, as many people do today. They see Jesus as a man. They say, well, yeah, Jesus was a good person. Jesus was a, was a prophet. You talk to some Muslim friends, if you have some, and they're going to say, yeah, Jesus was a prophet. He was a good man, but, but he didn't ascend to heaven. I don't believe in no flying Jesus, they would say. I had a friend of mine that I worked with. He was, he was, he was a Muslim, and, and he, he wanted to, uh, he wanted to uh, uh, convert me, and he tried really hard. And, 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 and he, would, he would try to share some things with me, but he, was, uh, he wasn't what I would consider a devout Muslim because he, he used some extremely foul language a lot of times and a lot of other things, and I knew some other, others that was a little more devout, and they wasn't like that. And so he, he began to share with me, and I, I, said, uh, I said, listen, let me tell you something. I said, tell me, tell me the foundation of what you believe. He said, well, we, we believe, and you know, like I said, he wasn't a, a, a faithful Muslim. He, he said, well, we believe in the Ten Commandments. I said, oh, okay, that's good. That's a good place for us to start. And we went over the Ten Commandments. I said, let me tell you something. I said, you're, you're, you're harping at me because I believe in the flying Jesus, you call it. I said, but you say you believe in the Ten Commandments. I said, but I can tell by the way you live your life right now. You're not following that. You're not following that. And I said, when you get that right, come and, come and talk to me. I said, because I have a Savior. And I've been forgiven for my failures. You're still living it. You, you still got an answer for your mistakes, man. But he would try so hard. And he said, well, yeah, we know we believe in Jesus, but we don't believe that flying Jesus. He didn't ever ascend into heaven. But some people say he was a good man. He was a prophet. They see him as a man. But he was more than a man. Amen? He was the son of the living God. Amen? He was the son of the living God, the Savior of the world. So she asked... She asked Jesus, who she thought was the gardener. She says, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him. And I will get him. And the best part of the whole thing is when Jesus says to her, Mary. There's something about hearing, hearing the voice of God. When he calls your name. I don't know if you've ever had him get your attention or not. 
But it's almost like the same situation that Mary's in. When he calls your name, he says, Jason. And you're like, yeah. You don't hear it audibly, but you hear it when he speaks to your heart. Amen? Because, see, Jesus had already spoken to Mary. He said, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? But, but when she heard him speak her name, she didn't just hear with her ears. She heard him speak into her heart. Amen? And she's like, oh, my. It's similar to Thomas. When he, when, when, he, when he got to touch Jesus, he said, my Lord and my God. Mary's like, Rabbi, it's you. And then she grabbed a hold of him. And she grabbed a hold of him. Man, I, ca I can't even imagine the emotion that she experienced right then. Because she's like, when, when it talks about that she grabbed a hold of him, it's like, she grabbed a hold of him like, I am never letting you go again. It's not happening. I'm not letting you go. And Jesus rebukes her in a sense. I want, I want to show this to you. Worship team, you can begin to come up. I know if you're following my notes, I didn't follow them very well. It's okay. Do what? Can y'all do that victory song again? Thank you. Somebody say something? Oh, I thought I heard somebody say something. Where was I at? Somebody help me. Because, see, I'm not following my notes. And so, therefore... Oh, yeah. When, when, yeah, when she realized it was Jesus. Thank you all. I'm glad you all pay attention. You all help me. But when she grabbed a hold of him, and it's, it's just that... I don't even know how to describe it. I don't even know how to describe it. She just didn't want to let him go. She was so excited that he was alive. And Jesus, this is what he says to her. I don't even know where I'm at. Forget my notes. Um, Jesus said here in verse 17, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now if you're reading the King James, it's going to say this in verse 17. It's going to say that Jesus said, Do not touch me, or touch me not. Now I want you to understand, when you, when you begin to break that down, what's really translated there is Him saying, Don't hold on to me doesn't mean don't touch him. I mean, think about it. Later on we see the same resurrected Jesus before he's ascended tells the disciples, touch me. He tells Thomas, touch me. Stick your hand in my side. So Jesus wasn't saying don't touch me. He was saying don't hold on to me. Because listen, Mary wanted to hang on to the relationship that she had. A relationship with the Son of Man. Amen? The Son of Man that was, that was working miracles. The Son of Man that delivered her from her demonic possession. She wanted to hang on to Him in that aspect. But He's saying, no, wait a minute. You can't hold on to me this way. Because I have to ascend to my Father. Our relationship is going to go from being this relationship like I have with you guys to a spiritual relationship. He's not denying her the relationship. He's not denying her that fellowship between the two. But He's saying it's going to change. It's going to change because rather than me standing here in front of you, rather than me standing here as another person, as a man, He said, I'm going to be inside of you. Complete change in relationship. Amen? Complete change in relationship. When He called her name, it got her attention. Wanted her to understand that the relationship is going to be way more intimate than friendship. Way more intimate. Than I wonder today, have you ever heard him call your name? Have you ever heard the Lord call your name? Do you listen? Do you listen? Do you listen for that, that call? 
Because let me tell you something. Those four stages of belief is that, that stage of confusion, that stage of wonder. Then you search out the evidence. Amen? You go to church, you read your Bible, you talk to some fellow Christians, some people that, that you know might be able to steer you the right direction. You search out the evidence. And then thirdly, you have that encounter where you meet Jesus. You might not recognize Him. You might not understand who He is, but He's knocking at your heart's door. Amen? And lastly, you make a commitment. You make a commitment to Him and you say, My God, my Lord and my God. Like Jesus, or like Mary, grab an eye and you grab a hold of Him. You run to Him and you just grab a hold of Him and hang on. And you have that relationship. Not a physical relationship, but a intimate relationship because rather than being just there, relationship much more intimate of a relationship I hope today that you have that relationship with Jesus I hope today that you do I hope that you're not like Mary weeping at the grave I hope that you're not like John and, and Peter looking into the tomb wondering I hope that you have that relationship this morning to where you know you know Him as Lord that He lives inside of you through the Holy Spirit. I hope that's the relationship you have. If not, today's the day. Amen? If not, today's the day. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we thank You. We thank You, Lord God, for Your Word. God, we thank You for this message. And God, I pray that You've spoken to the hearts and the minds of Your people today. Hallelujah. Lord, we give You glory today, God. We thank You, for Father, for for sending Your Son to die on the cross, to suffer death, to be buried, but only to be raised to life three days later, and now ascended into heaven, seated at Your right hand, interceding for us. Lord, we give You glory tonight, today. We thank You, Lord. We thank You, Lord, for Your love and Your mercy and Your grace. Hallelujah. Everybody put your hand over your heart. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus. Now say it loud. You're shouting it to heaven. Amen. Say it loud. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me. I thank you for loving me. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. And I believe that you rose from the grave. That you're seated on the right hand of the Father praying for me. Help me, Lord, to live for you. Help me to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. As they lead in that song, if you need special prayer, you just want to come to the altar. Amen. The invitation is open. If you need prayer, I want to pray with you this morning. Hallelujah. worship for a few moments before they get done here. If you'll stand to your feet. I know we're a little later than normal, but glory to God, it's Easter. Amen. Hallelujah.
reach out your hand towards Robin. She's she's dealing with some uh, family matters, and, and she just needs prayer. Amen. She's uh, she's she's struggling with some some personal things here that, that just uh, well, we're not going to share the details, but she lost her dad and she's just struggling. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. We just come to you right now, Lord. Lord, we pray for Lord God for victory. God, I pray that you give her victory. Let's close in a word of prayer this morning. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for coming. Some of you that come to both services this morning, thank you so much. And uh, I look forward to worshiping again next week. Amen. Praise the Lord. Pray for me. I've got uh, uh, a visit that I need to make to someone, and I pray that it goes well. Amen. Someone that needs the Lord, needs to come back to the Lord, needs to, uh, needs to be in church somewhere. Amen. And so pray that that uh, pray for a victory. Amen. Pray for victory because it's the bondage of the enemy that tries to keep someone out of the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 
Praise the Lord. Brother Mike, will you close us in a word of prayer? Amen. Now, if you have kids with you, Timmy Ray, you in charge? Okay. If you have kids with you, make sure they go with Timmy Ray, and they're going to go out and hunt eggs. Because you're too big. You can pick up the leftovers that they miss. <laughs>